Hello, and welcome back to the Heritage Boatworks podcast. This is episode number six. Hi there, welcome back to Heritage Boatworks. Uh, This podcast is dedicated to exploring, promoting, and preserving boat building in New England. My goal is to travel the uh, towns of New England and to interview the folks that build boats in this area. They all seem to have a story to tell, and, uh, and I want to share that with you. So uh, we are just about a month out from our last podcast. Um, I'm, I'm sticking to my schedule here. It's going pretty well. I, I really, really enjoy doing this. Uh, I actually noticed on, on uh, iTunes I had a couple of, uh, of reviews, uh, five-star reviews. And thank you very much to those folks uh, for leaving those. Uh, they, they mean a lot. So if, you, if you're an iTunes user and you, uh, and you enjoy this podcast, please feel free to give me some feedback there. Uh, I put out my first newsletter uh, I'm going to do that monthly. It's going to be kind of a uh, announcement that, that the podcast is coming out. So if you're looking for kind of an update of when these will be out, I know I don't, uh, I don't stick to certain dates in the month. They kind of come out at the end of each month. So if you want to be notified when the podcast is coming out, please go to my website, uh, heritageboatworks.com forward slash contact. That will bring you to a short form uh, to fill out, and you can get on my mailing list. Uh, for the record, I, I work in the IT industry, and I really hate spam, so I will not spam you. This is just for the monthly newsletter and uh, and for the podcast updates and updates to my blog and whatever else is going on at Heritage Boatworks. Uh, you can also connect with me on Facebook and Twitter. It's uh, My username is um, HeritageBW, so I typically update Facebook and Twitter uh, a couple times a day, so a lot going on there. So as far as the newsletter goes, I've I've taken a direction with that. All of the subscribers to the newsletter heard of this podcast before it came out. Uh, Also, I'm going to be coming out with a resource guide. It's just kind of a, a number of links I have or that I use when I'm building boats, what I use to choose designs where I get my supplies, just a lot of of real useful links. Uh, And I'm going to offer that for free as long as you sign up for my newsletter. But if you are are already signed up, you are going to get that a month in advance. So if that interests you, uh, I hope it will help you. There's no charge for it. So uh, sign up and, uh, and I will get that to you once I finish it. Um, An update on the cat boat. So I've taken a, a a new direction with my cat boat. It's um, I'm still building the same boat, still doing the same design, same materials, everything else. What I'm doing, <clears throat> it's it's partly because I want to educate my daughter in boat building, and it's partly <laughs> it's partly the tricky husband that says, "Hey, I'm spending time with my daughter. Uh, I'm going to go build my boat." So it's bought me a little more time building my boat. Gee, I, ho- I hope my wife doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> she'll, she'll figure me out. So I've, I've turned my boat building into boat building class. I'm working with Maggie. She is very, my, my daughter, who is very artistic. She's seven years old, very creative. Um, and she has jumped in with both feet. She absolutely loves doing this and asks a whole lot of questions and we're really having a fun time doing that. If, uh, if you want more detail on it and some pictures and everything else, check out my blog. Uh, every time Maggie and I have a class, it's once a week that we have boat building class that we go down in the basement and just her and I spend a couple hours on the boat. Uh, I update the blog with with what we did with some pictures and everything else. So it's, it's really fun for me. Uh, I think she's having a great time. And I'm kind of passing along the boat, the wooden boat building gene, hopefully. Uh, so check out the blog. It's on heritageboatworks.com and click on the HBW blog link. That'll bring you right there. It's kind of tedious right now because right now I'm just measuring and cutting panels, all the different parts of it. Uh, she's enjoying the measuring part and, and hammering in the nails for the battens. She enjoys that part. 
but it, it gets a little tedious drawing lines, making measurements, and, and spending uh, a half an hour just to trace one line isn't really conducive to a seven-year-old's attention span. So when she gets bored, she I hand her a block plane with it set to a really fine setting just so she doesn't do too much damage, and uh, she works on the mast. The mast is over on the bench, so she can just go over and, and plane away for a little while while I, I make some measurements. So it's going really well, and check out the, the blog for those updates. So let's hop right into the interview. This was really, it was an unexpected interview, and, and, uh, and it really turned out to be one of the best so far. I, I, I keep saying that, I know, and I'm sorry, but they, every time I interview somebody, it seems to get a little better. This was Roger Crawford at Crawford, um, Crawford Boat Building. And in the interview, I say it's in Marshfield, Massachusetts, but it's in a, actually in a town called Hummer Rock, Massachusetts, which I actually had never heard of. It's it's this, just this little tiny area of, right by Marshfield on the water. And uh, I kind of called him on a whim because I was heading out in that area, and and he was gracious enough to give me an interview. And, and man, it was a great one. I, I don't know if I've ever met somebody so passionate about their craft. Um, just a, a fantastic guy, and the boats he builds are, are simply works of art. And I think the people that have bought him bought these boats from him over the years know that. They, they are gorgeous. They're melon seed skiffs. And, uh, and he really puts uh, his heart and, and all of his talent into each and every boat that's gone out the door. Um, and it's a really great interview. So without uh, delaying any longer... Um, Take it away, Roger Crawford. All right, I am here in Marshfield, Massachusetts, uh, at Crawford Boat Building, and I am speaking with Roger Crawford today, the owner of Crawford Boat Building. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Roger. Thank you for having me. And just a little history for my listeners here. I, I was at my other job with my finger quotes, and I had kind of an emergency meeting in Hingham, and uh, I was like, oh, wow, that, that's an opportunity. I could go interview some folks out there. There's got to be boat builders in Hingham, Marshfield, that area. So I found, uh, I found Crawford Boat Building online uh, very quickly. So you should know that. It's, it's ranked pretty high in Google. And from what I can tell, we have uh, melon seed skiffs are, are kind of uh, your, your primary build. That's a, we actually uh, built uh, four or five different boats in the shop here over the years. Uh, reaching a grand total of somewhere over 750 boats. Um, wow. But preceding the Melon Seed, um, I built 200 Swamp Skid Sailing Dories, some Gunning Dories, Yacht Tenders, Rowing Skiffs. Nice. Um, but when the Melon Seed Skiff came into my life in, I guess, the late 80s is where it started, it um, became my obsession and ultimately became um, what will define my life's work. The Melon Seed Skiff, I think, is a boat that I'll always be known for. Nice. And to this date, uh, we've built um, 489. Excellent. Of them. Is that number 489 in the mold? That is four, that's number 490 Excellent. in the mold. Yeah. So, so what I'd like to do with the interview is uh, I'd like to get a little history about you personally, how you got here, uh, a little history about Crawford boat building, and uh, and how you landed on the Melon Seed Skiff, because it's, it's such a beautiful boat. I, I see them on the Cape all the time, and, uh, and they're gorgeous. And then we can do kind of a little uh, a, a promotional thing towards the end of, sure. uh, of how people get in touch with you. So sure. why don't we start with you? Um, well, how did you land here and maybe, let's say, after high school? I was, um, I was born um, a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> a couple years back. Yeah. Somewhere during the latter part of the Second World War, let's put it that way. That's yeah. how ancient I am. Um, and I grew up in Milton, which is a fairly upscale community, and I did all the things I was expected to do and went to college in Boston and got out of college and didn't have a clue what I wanted to do with myself and um, walked down the street, went down, knocked on the door of Boston Whaler and said, well, I'm out of college, here's my degree in management, and, and uh, um, so how about you hire me in the management training program? And I said, well, we don't really have one. And besides <laughs> that, we don't, we don't hire guys like you because you'll be bored and unhappy and leave after two weeks. All right. So, um, but you'll never be happy building boats, he said to me. So, sent me on my merry way. I then got in the surfing business, and I was one of the folks that sort of pioneered the surfing business and industry in New England in the 1960s. So I spent all of the magical 1960s in the magical surf world. 
and I ran a chain of five Hobie surf shops up and down the New England coast uh, from 1965 to 1970. Um, surfed competitively on the Hobie surf team up and down the East Coast. Surfboards were my life, um, and somehow or other fiberglass sort of fit into all that as well. So my first experiences with fiberglass go back actually into the 50s and then all through the 60s, messing around with surfboards as well. Mm -hmm. I, uh, did you build any wood surfboards? No, I never would. Um, oh, they're always fiberglass over polyurethane foam. Okay. Um, I would close the surf shops down, that industry kind of get tired, and then I closed those down, went to the Caribbean for the better part of four years on and off and surfed. Nice. Um, can't imagine ever being able to do that again, because uh, I think you used to spend about $800 a year to, to do the whole trip. Wow. It's pretty remarkable to be there for six months, but right, you know. Right. Uh, and we come back, and eventually I got a job working in a boat yard, and I was a salesman um, in a marina in Green Harbor selling power boats. A friend of mine was also starting up a company building beautiful small power boats. In 1973, when the energy crisis hit, um, I no longer had a job selling power boats, right. and so I went to uh, work for a friend of mine, this friend of mine, whose business was struggling, and said, let me help you out, I'm a fairly good salesman. It worked out real well. I sold more boats than he could build. Nice. Um, what, what kind of boats were those? These were beautiful 17-foot center console Novi hulls, down east design. Okay. Um, they're legendary boats, the finest kind, 17. Incredible boats. Nice. And I worked for an extraordinarily talented man, uh, John Blanchard. And I learned more in two years working for John Blanchard than I could have learned in 20 years anywhere else. Right, right. Eventually, um, for a number of reasons, it was time for me to move on. And um, John Blanchard had a mold for a 16 foot swamp to Dory. I bought that, moved on, um, started my own business with no money. <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, Went to my first, I didn't even have, actually, I technically didn't even have a business yet. I just went into Boston to a boat show, lied my way into the show, told them I had a business building boats. Uh, I didn't even have a shop. I had no tools. I had nothing. But I fooled a lot of people, and I sold six boats at the show. And you so had the mold. I had, I had the mold only. That was it. That's it. Uh, so back to the local, <laughs> local bank. Um, borrowed the incredible sum of money at that time, $3,000, and... Um, started building boats in a little shop across the street from where we are here in 1976. To fill those orders? Yeah, to fill those orders that have been back ordered since. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's 38, I don't know how many years or something like that now, and 700 and something boats later. Wow, that's so amazing. it's been an interesting story. Absolutely. No boat builder will tell you his life story um, um, when they've had a couple of beers, at least, without telling you um, some of the tragedies involved, because it's not an easy route. And I think anybody who's spent nearly four decades in this industry has seen plenty of ups and downs economically. Uh, personally, it's challenging working with some of these materials, um, um, but it's a great it's a great lifestyle, and mm -hmm. it's incredibly satisfying to uh, to see your own work um, out there making other people really happy. Um, it's a that's pretty satisfying stuff. That's you know that's a, kind of a common thread uh, I've had with these interviews is is the satisfaction. That, that people get out of the, the, the business, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I build boats in my basement, and I get that feeling when I'm done with a boat. I, I can only imagine what it's like when you're when you're building some of these beautiful boats out here and actually handing them off to people. Yeah, there. I, I because the customers don't know this because they they're driving away, but I I walk out into the street as they drive off of the behind their car, and I watch that boat go out of sight as long as I can possibly see it, and uh, it's a very warming feeling. Um, and um, but, you know, there, but there, it's like, but you know, in a lot of ways, the, um, you know, boat building is one of those jobs that people will automatically imagine as being um, just so romantic. But there are days, and you know, that it, there, are, there are bad days down here, and there are good days down here, right, right. Uh, like any other job. Um, and I've had plenty of the bad days. Uh, but you, you know, every day you walk out of here, though, you, you, I look behind where you know, I look behind myself as I lock the door. And um, I see what's sitting here on the shop floor, and you know, and that's that feels really good, no matter how bad the day was. Do you look forward to coming to work? When you I do, yeah. I do, I do, I do. People ask me, you know, you know, you, when are you going to retire? And I just, I said, I can't imagine retiring. Yeah. I can't imagine not having this in my life. Dentists right. retire, lawyers retire, bookkeepers retire, teachers retire. Um, God knows, union guys retire, um, but boat builders just sort of don't retire. They right. just do it as long as they can because it just feels. 
it just fills them up, I think, with uh, all those rewards that we talk about. Yeah, it's not a job. It's, uh, it's a way of life. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny you say that you, uh, you watch the boat go down the street. My first boat I owned was, uh, was a 22-foot sloop, uh, Kells 22. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, really Real. Uh, yeah. I, I don't want to offend anybody that might own a Kells, but a total piece of junk, yeah. in my opinion. And this boat I bought, I paid $700 for it. So it was a boat that wasn't that nice, even in worse shape. Um, but it was my first boat, sure. and I ripped it apart, I gutted it, and I repaired everything. And I loved doing that. I took the boat out sailing. I didn't even want to sail the boat. I just wanted to bring it home and work on it some more, because yeah. there were so many things I loved fixing. But uh, I really kind of didn't like that boat. It drove me crazy. It made my wife angry at me, because I spent so much time on it. But when I sold that boat and that person drove off, I stood there in tears mm -hmm. and watched it drive off, even though this was a boat that drove me crazy sure. for two years. Yeah. Um, so I know the feeling. I do know the feeling. Once you put all your hard work into it and you know that it's going to somebody that's going to appreciate your hard work, uh, it's a really kind of a heartwarming feeling. We so, do yeah. think of them as living things in some way. You know, we Absolutely. assign this, this um, <clears throat> personality to them. You know, we give them feminine names in most cases. Um, and we think of them as, you know, living parts of our lives, you know, yep. those, whether we sail them or just work on them or even dream of them, perhaps. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so, tell me a little more. So you started uh, you started Crawford Boat Building kind of on a wing and a prayer, a mold and a, and a small loan, well, a large loan in those days. Um, how, how has Crawford Boat Building progressed since then? Now, what year was that that you took the loan out? Uh, 1976. 76, okay. Yeah. Um, I think that um, because I worked for a guy, uh, John Blanchard, for a couple of years who was just enormously talented, I think that I always wanted to be as good as John. Mm -hmm. That was my goal, was to be as good as John. Right. It would be impossible to ever imagine that I could ever be better, because we all get better. So it, I'd never, you know, you know, I'd be playing catch up forever as long as John's breathing. Right. Um, but that was my goal, a set of standard of high quality. Um, I had parents and grandparents that were craftsmen, and it was always about quality. Um, so that, I think, was the first thing, is I wanted to do the very best I could. It, admittedly, now I look at my workmanship now, 750 boats later, and it's a heck of a lot better than it was on hull number one, two, or four, or five. Right. Um, so we've gotten better. Um, the I don't know many boat builders that are sort of a small one or two man shops that um, are have a strong economic base. Mostly it's guys that are artists that are passionate. Mm -hmm. And you're more of an artist than you are a businessman. And I think during the early years, I think just figuring out how to make a living at this was a huge challenge for perhaps the first 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, how to make money, how to, how to make this worthwhile. Um, there are lots of times when I wondered if it would ever work out, if, it, if it I would be able to stay in this business. But then along came the melon seed, and suddenly the demand for the boat was so great, um, so fast, that I was able to sort of learn to manage the different flow of money that was coming my way, and to learn how to build up inventory, to maintain it, to move production along so we could get as many at one point um, as you know, 20, 27 boats, 28 boats out the door one year. Um, wow. So it was a combination of, of uh, taking physical talents, uh, the artistic passion, and learning to run the business right. all at the same time. And, um, and now, you know, in my you know, pushing almost four decades of this, now I've sort of managed to juggle, I won't say master, but I've learned to be able to juggle those different tasks well enough um, that I'm pretty durable um, in spite of the, you know, the recessions and the ebbs and flows of the economy and the melon seed is a boat that will always have a, a, a demand, right, will always be a right. good demand for it, so, um, so I'm very fortunate in this case. But. How, did you, uh, how did you stumble on the melon seed? That, well, tell me a little history about it. The melon seed is a, a little history of the melon seed itself. It's a duck honey boat from the, from the mid to late 1800s. Okay. And there is very little information available about it. Uh, what little there is, for the most part, is in Chappelle's, Howard Chappelle's American Small Sailing Craft. Right. And, um, but apparently the, the, the most likely version of the story is essentially that duck hunting was, was much as clamming or fishing or scalloping or any other form of, form of, um, of uh, fisheries is uh, 
duck hunting um, for feathers and for, and for meat was, it was a pretty serious occupation in the Atlantic Flyway in the 1800s. Okay. The feathers were valuable. You, you look at the women's hats in the 1800s right, and right. The, feathers, yeah. the feathers and, and the meats and birds always hung in markets you know, for sale back then. Um, and so they had boats that were called gunning boats and there were two or three very successful gunning boats um, in the, particularly in the Delaware and, and uh, Chesapeake Bay areas. But mostly they were boats that were backwater boats, shallow boats, marsh boats, boats you'd hunt in the marsh, uh, mm -hmm. low freeboard, uh, not intended to be in open water. And the melon seed was specifically designed to not only work in those sort of backwater marshy areas, but right. to take on open water. Okay. And it does incredibly well. It's a remarkably seaworthy boat. Huh. And uh, you, you would look at this lovely lady in all her elegance and you'd imagine that it's just a dainty little thing and it hardly, I've sailed a boat in 37 miles an hour of wind. Wow. 30, no reefs. 37 miles an hour of wind. They, it, look, they look fast. Yeah, they're pretty slippery. Yeah. yeah they're pretty good. Yeah, they, uh, um, it's a beautiful little boat. So the, uh, so the, the melon sea was sort of like the stealth, you know, the stealth hunter of, the, of its day in the duck hunting world. Right. But they just went by the wayside like all you know, combustion engines came along and people didn't need things anymore that they used to have to have in their lives. And um, suddenly melon seed just sort of just faded away. Mm -hmm. and, and there were very few of them in existence. I think um, there might have been a handful of wooden ones at best in this country. Uh, Mystic Seaport, I believe, built six as a part of a, a workshop project they had in the yeah. 1970s. Yep. But I, I think I'd be fair, I think it'd be fair to say there might have been less than a dozen of them still around, most of them in, in, in terrible condition, if, if, if even usable. Mm -hmm. um, someone called me, I, let, me, let me back up a bit, someone called me up at the shop and asked me if I would rebuild an old, old wooden boat that he had bought for a very small amount of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I, at the time I was doing a phenomenal amount of, of repairs and restoration of older boats, mostly taking boats that were wooden classics and they were hopeless and finding a way to fiberglass them back together without making them look ugly. Right. Um, I done. I have done thousands and thousands of boat repairs. Uh, you know, so many of them just small hundred dollar jobs and some of them eight thousand dollar jobs and ten thousand dollar jobs. Um, but I had this reputation for, for being the guy to go to, take it to him, he can fix anything kind of guy. Right. So people yeah. would bring me these god awful projects and, 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 you know, and they'd be so full of excitement about their boat uh, and they'd bring in a boat that was worth 500 bucks that would need 5,000 bucks worth of work, you know, and I'd end up doing 4,000 and they wouldn't want to pay me for it. So, right, right. you know, I learned to try to stay away from some of these projects and from the romances that these, these owners would, would drag to the, my doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a call from a fellow and he said, I have this old wooden boat and I'd like it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm, my, my, my wife at the time was a little annoyed with the fact that I would, uh, I would take on these, these projects. Yeah. And... Um, and he said, no, no, you have to see this boat. If you see this boat, and I said, I don't want to see the boat. <laughs> I said, I just r really declined to do this. I said, I, I can't make enough money doing these kinds of jobs, so I prefer that you find someone else to do it. And he said, no, no, you, they tell me you're the guy. Well, I may be the guy, but I'm not doing it. He said, do you work on Saturdays? And I said, and I lied. And I said, no, I'm never there on Saturdays, and I'm always here. At least in those days, always here on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll bring it down Saturdays. I won't be here. <laughs> and so I... On that particular Saturday, which I believe is in November of 1980, good, good thing for his seven, persistence, right? <laughs> I stayed away from the shop all day, and I yeah. was up in the center of town running errands. And I looked around. And there was this guy with this old wooden beat-up boat on his roof, driving around completely lost, looking to try to find, obviously, my boat shop. Right. So I ducked around the town for a couple more hours, uh, figuring he must have gone back to wherever he came from with the boat given up. And I got back to the shop, and there it was on my doorstep, like Moses in a basket. <laughs> it was on my doorstep. So I took one look at it, and I, and I just, there was something about it that was not only horrifying because of the condition, but also intoxicating because of the lines. Right. So I did a very prudent thing. I took it around the back of the shop, and I covered it up with a blue poly tarp, and I said, I'm not looking at this thing. Right. If I look at this thing, I will become seduced, and I yeah. can't afford to. So it, it must have sat out in the back of the shop two or three weeks, and... Um, we have a lot of curmudgeon boat shop characters that come around the shop and want to know what's going on around here, and they kept going around the back of the shop, and they would peek under the top, you know. <laughs> and they'd come running in, and they'd say, you're going to work on that? And i say, no, no, I'm not going to work on that. Don't talk to me about it. <laughs> but I, too, was peeking. Yeah. And, uh, and one day I just uh, I said, oh, that thing's gorgeous. That is so beautiful. So uh, um, against all reason, uh, my better judgment, um, a lot of other people's opinions, um, I went ahead with the project of restoring the boat, 
So that was an old wooden. Yeah, wood, no and it was seen. and it was never completely finished. It was a boat that someone started to build to the Howard Chappelle plans. Okay, so it was a home built. Y yes, it okay. was started out as a home built boat, never finished. It was it was just uh, sort of barely put together as a hull and deck. So I fiberglassed it and um, just realized what a beautiful set of lines. It had to sail. It had to sail. How was it built? Was it built? It was strip plywood? built. Uh, the bottom, the okay. bottom was strip built, and the deck was uh, plywood. Okay. Um, but it was built pretty accurately to the to the plans in the Chappelle book. Um, nice. And uh, I asked the owner if I could test sail it before I gave it back to him all completed, and he said, "Fine, I did." And I was astounded. Right. It was just I was blown away. Yeah. And seduced. As you oh said. my God! Yeah. Said, not only, you know, it's interesting when when the prettiest girl at the dance is also the best dancer. Right, right. And that was the case. So I think we all have expectations at the beginning of any romantic adventure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, every fantasy has a happy ending. Right. You know, every dream of a boat has a happy ending. Um, and it's, but it's, you know, life is interesting. You know, all the fantasies don't come true. All the happy endings are not always there. Right, um, right. But this was a case where it was just, it just was, it worked, it was sailed beautifully, it was simple, the rig. Um, it just was everything I'd ever imagined in a boat that I thought was really highly marketable. What is the rig? Is that a lug rig? It's called a sprit rig. Sprit rig. It's, okay. it's a quadrilateral rig, like, like, like a gaff, like a lug. Yep. Um, many other sails are uh, quadrilateral, but the sprit is the simplest sail rig in the world. There is right. no other rig that sets as much sail as in, with a low center of effort like this with a very, uh, with a very simple uh, light system of three sticks. Right. It's incredible. And the proper definition of a sprit rig, among other things, is it will fit inside the boat. Ah, okay. So you, have, you can stow the whole rig down inside the boat. There's no, all the mast, the sprit, and the boom are all, uh, are all 10 feet long. And I noticed they have oar locks on them. Too. Yeah, because as, as a hunting boat, it, it had to go out all seasons in all seasons. And so you might be out there when, when it was windless. Right. You know, and you had to get home windless. You know, when, when, so the boat is a superb. And you're not going to sneak up on any ducks with the sail on them. No. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic boat to row. It, it, I mean, most it almost looks like a, a kind of a fat rowing shell. Almost. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of great sailboats, other workboat sailboats out there, traditional workboats that, that you know that sail really well. But not many good sailboats are set up to row well. But, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't row yeah. a catboat. No, but, but the melon seat is. You know, people say to me, "How well does it go to windward and light air?" And I say, "It goes dead to windward and light air, three knots." Yeah, right, right. Because yeah, it will row beautifully. So. Um, when you're out there on, the, on a summer evening and the wind dies and the bugs come out and you're you know a mile from home, bang, you know you're, right. you're just heading home at three knots uh, with a pair of oars. And, you know. So I'm building my daughter a um, a Bulger Bobcat. Oh, great, great boat. And uh, I'm sitting here during this interview thinking I should be building a melon seat. <laughs> How, uh, how stable are they? Extremely stable. Are they really? that's, it, it is. If I were to uh, <laughs> to take an experienced sailor out in the melon seed, mm -hmm. um, and this was the scenario, I'd say, I'm going to take you out on a sailboat. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to tell you how big it is, yeah. what its displacement is. I'm not going to tell you anything about the boat. I'm going to take you out on a nice 10 or 12 knot day. I'm going to sit you in the boat blindfolded. And we're going to go out sailing. And then after 10 minutes of sailing, I said to you, how big do you think this boat is? I would guarantee you, say, 16, 17 feet at least. Really? Because it has that feel. It is yeah, a right. rock-solid boat, in spite of the fact that it weighs 235 pounds. Its hull is most unusual. There's a phenomenal Two, amount of buoyancy. I'm sorry, you said 235? 235, yeah. There's wow. a phenomenal amount of buoyancy in the midsection of the melon seed hull. Um, and the boat is all about um, stability, buoyancy, uh, capability, um, it has a low center of effort sail, which exerts very little sort of, you know, force on the boat to cause it to heel over. Right, right. Um, it's just one of those wonderful designs that hates to tip over. Yeah. Hates the tip. Um, on our webpage is a pretty graphic explanation of all the, the factors that go into that. But surprisingly enough, at 235 pounds, it'll withstand more wind and weather than most cruising sailboats, you know, will with a double reef. That's um, great. Now, what, <clears throat> what, what about the boat? Um, makes it hate to tip over, so to speak. Is, that, is there a specific uh, well, design? Start by imagining that um, that other than helium, I think probably air. You know, air flows better than anything else we know. All a boat is is a bubble of air. Right. That's right. all it is is a bubble of air. It's wrapped in wood or plastic or rubber or fiberglass or whatever it is that you build a boat out of. 
but all you are doing is trapping a bubble of air. Right. So it's what the designer does with the shape of this bubble that makes this boat perform well. So a submarine's bubble would be different than a kayak's bubble or an aircraft carrier's bubble or a melon seed's bubble. Yeah. But if you're out in the 1800s duck hunting in the middle of the winter, long before you could pick up a cell phone and dial 911, I'm having a bad day out here, right, right. and your boat has to get you home. Or a dry suit. Or a dry suit. <laughs> you're going to shape uh, this bubble of air that you're going to hunt in or fish in um, so that you're maximizing the buoyancy that air offers you. Okay. So if you take the volume of, if you, if, you, if you put most of this air and distribute the volume so that most of this air is in the widest section of the boat, furthest outboard, okay. you've got virtually a description of the melon seed hull. Its bilges are extremely um, full and buoyant. Okay. So when you try to push any boat and tip it over, basically what you're doing is you're over trying to overcome the buoyancy within the hull. Right, right. And so when you put the buoyancy outside where it becomes a tremendous supporting factor, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, get, you get all this um, resistance to tipping, essentially. In boats, what, what happens eventually when you have enough wind and, and you force them, they either go over or they go forward. Right. That's right. their two choices. They round up. Yeah, they go forward. So the more pressure you put on, the faster the boat goes, the faster the boat goes, the more lift it gets. Yeah. Because if you take a skipping stone, it just keeps on skipping. Or you know, the faster it goes, the more it skips. Right, right. So if it doesn't tip over, which it hates to do, it just goes forward faster. Yeah. Um, and so the boat just sort of squirts along um, merrily in its way. So you know, a small crab warning day for the, for the melon sea is, is not an uncomfortable. It's, you know, it may be a little wet, but but you're not in trouble. And you can reef the sail as well. You cannot reef the sail. Oh, you cannot. Okay. No, like that one has reef points on. Yeah, we put. Interestingly enough, we because there's no boom, right? Well, yeah, boom is up. Yeah, you've got a, a boom. But interestingly enough, we um, we automatically put reef points in the sail for the first 15 or 20 boats we built, right. assuming that. Well, you always just do that. Right, right. And then one day the sailmaker said to me, uh, how's it sail reefed? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've never reefed. <laughs> I've never had a reef. You know? right. uh, he, he said, well, take them out. They're costing you 50 bucks a boat at the time. And I said, right. fine, take them out. Besides that, you cannot reef a melon seed at sea. It's not practical to get up at the deck of this and do all the things you have to do. Right, yeah. So my argument in this, in this situation is if it's so rough, that you feel you have to need reef a melon seed, you know, Pull the oars out. you don't go out, right. you know, because I mean, these things are legendary in, in how much wind they can sail. And, um, and if you're out there in a melon seed and it blows up, first of all, it's an, it's an extremely hard boat to tip. But yeah. secondly, where are you? Yeah. You're not on the Gulf Stream. You know, you're a couple of miles from home someplace. Yeah. You know, you're not at great risk. The boat will get you home, and it always has. Right. For, right. Over 20-something over, you know, years now, everybody's always managed to get home. So That's it's great. just extraordinarily capable boat in heavy weather, and uh, we're pretty proud of what it, what it can do for itself. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, um, I don't want to waste too much more of your time. Um, let me, uh, why don't you, if people are interested in seeing the melon seed, uh, just for my listeners, I'm going to take some pictures um, right now, actually, and you'll see them on the, on the blog um, with some notes on the interview. Uh, and tell me, Roger, how would people get in touch with you if they wanted to just, buy melon seed? Just like everybody else seems to start the process, you'd go to melonseed.com. Right. Um, you mentioned we're ranked pretty high. Yeah, we're number one, two, three, ten, twenty. Yeah, right. Time, there's nobody else doing this. Yeah. Really. Um, but the melon seed webpage is really an interesting webpage. Um, web, web pages are selling tools, but the web, our webpage is more than that. There's fun in there, there's humor. Um, there's interesting reading and photographs, slideshows, um, movies, uh, and a great description of why this boat uh, does what it does so well, helping to explain to people whether it is the right or not the right boat uh, for them. Right, right. Um, so, you know, if they go to melonseed.com, there's so much to learn about the boat. And that's great. Now, are you, uh, do you know of anyone else that's building the melon seed in the country, or on um, the East Coast, anyway? No, there's a, there's, there are a couple of Boat builders, I think there's one on the west coast somewhere that Do them here and sort of there. jumps on the bandwagon, has jumped on a bandwagon, built yeah. something that sort of they think looks like a melon seed, they think is a melon seed, and they call it a melon seed. Um, but I, I have some thoughts about whether it truly is a melon seed. Yeah, right, right. Or not. Um, you, know, you know, there's only one Porsche, you know, there's only one Lamborghini. You yeah. know, you just don't suddenly go up and put your own, you know, add up for it's because you're building Lamborghinis. No, you're not. No, it's not a Porsche. It's a Chevy Forbear. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, one more thing, if I could just... Uh, Roger and I were talking prior to this interview, and, and uh, 
and he mentioned what um, kind of the philosophy of New England boat building, and, and I, I was explaining the philosophy of my site and what I'm trying to do uh, with this project, and it, and if you could re-say what you were saying about the uh, the integrity of Boston boat, uh, New England boat building. Yeah, I think there's you know there's uh, sort of the, a number of builders in New England. Um, it's probably greater than any, any other part of the country um, on a per square mile basis. Um, and for the most part, we know each other, or we know of each other, and we respect each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we may be better competitors, but we're also pretty good friends. Right. And, but we also feel, I think, a part of a community that has a certain reputation. And I think we all want that reputation to be honored on a continuing basis, and so I think we, we feel we have to be at least as good as our, as our, as our peers in the industry, um, good enough to keep the reputation of quality of New England boat building alive, mm -hmm. and I think we do it. At least I do, um, but I suspect my peers in the industry do the same thing. I build every one of these boats for myself. Mm -hmm. This is to please me. This is how, I make a living at it, but I right. do this to please myself. And the end result is something that I need to be proud of, and, I, and I'm sure that you'll find that, that most of the other builders in New England will feel the same way. From, from the interviews I've done so far, uh, and from the folks that I know, yes, absolutely. They, they, all, uh, mm -hmm. they all build them as if they were giving them to a family member. Um, and it's got to be perfect. It's got to be flawless. It's got to be uh, bomb-proof. And, and yeah, it's uh, it's definitely there's definitely a standard to be upheld in, in New England. And I think uh, I think everybody kind of sticks to that. I think if you don't uphold that standard, then you're not staying in business. Essentially, people will ask me. They say, "What's the best boat you ever built?" And my answer is, "I haven't built it yet." <laughs> right. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, okay, well, so, uh, yeah, if you want more information on these melon seeds, they are gorgeous, and I'm going to get a bunch of pictures of them. Uh, they're going to be really easy to take pictures of because they are beautiful. Um, go to melonseed.com. Sure. Uh, Roger, thank you so much for your time. My and, pleasure, thanks uh, for being here. And, uh, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. All right, again, many thanks to Roger Crawford for taking the time to sit down with me and uh, and share his his tale of how he got into boat building. So, um, my next one will likely be with a boat builder that I am quite fond of um, down in South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Feel free to email me. I'm at jed at heritageboatworks.com. Uh, connect with me on Facebook and Twitter. My username is heritagebw. Uh, and be sure to go to that contact form uh, on my webpage uh, and get that newsletter so I can keep you updated and send you my free um, e-resource guide. I don't even know if you can put an e in front of that, but, uh, but <laughs> it works. Um, thanks again for coming along, and, uh, and I look forward to another episode in a month. Fair winds.